Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this third webinar of the second edition of the Yes GoTech webinar series. Uh, this webinar series is focused on reactive gases. Today we have uh, Crystal Selwer as, as our speaker. Uh, he will be talking about measurement of tropospheric ozone. Um, before starting the presentation, I will just remind you the code of conduct. Please be polite and respectful to all the speakers and to all the participants and, and the speakers, I'm sorry. Uh, please type your questions in the chat box uh, during the presentation. And after, after Crystal's presentation, uh, we will have a, a short Q&A and your questions will be answered. And right now we are recording all contents in presentation, Q&A and messages in the chat box and the, the webinar will be uploaded tomorrow to the YES YouTube channel and to GOTEP YouTube channel as well. So now I give the floor to Sonia, who will introduce our speaker. Yeah, welcome everyone to our webinar series. I'd like to introduce the speaker today. We have Christoph Zellweger with us. He's from EMPA. Christoph uh, studied chemistry at the ETH in Zürich and did his uh, PhD at the High Alpine Research Station Jungfrau Joch on the topic of reactive nitrogen species in the atmosphere. Since the year 2000, he is heading the World Calibration Center for Service, Surface uh, Ozone, Carbon Monoxide, Methane and Carbon Dioxide. He has conducted more than 100 system and performance audits at stations of the GORE program. And he is also a member of the WMO GORE Scientific Advisory Group for Reactive Gases and uh, the GORE expert team on atmospheric composition measurement quality and the GORE expert team on measurement uncertainty and the task group on ozone cross section change management. His topic today is measurement of tropospheric ozone. Thank you very much for being here today and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sonia. Thank you very much, uh, Valentina, for uh, the invitation to uh, give uh, this um, seminar today, this webinar today. I will try to share my screen, which is always a little bit tricky uh, because I have too many screens but I think it sh soon should work. I think I have to go to presentation mode. Okay, so you can, now you can see my, my screen in presentation mode probably. Is that correct? Okay. Okay, so uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so it's a pleasure uh, to give uh, this webinar today. Uh, I will talk about measurements uh, of tropospheric ozone um, and Let's just start with uh, some rationale for trace gas measurements. As you all know, uh, air pollutants and greenhouse gases emitted uh, by human activities have a big uh, impact on our planet. Um, we have global issues um, like uh, climate change, for example, which is mainly caused uh, by greenhouse gases, uh, here mainly by uh, CO2 and uh, methane emissions, uh, but also ozone is, is a greenhouse gas, but it's not long-lived, so it's a little bit uh, less important, but nevertheless also ozone is a greenhouse gas. And then we have other effects um, where ozone plays uh, more uh, a role, uh, like for example summer smog, uh, where we can have a build-up of, of severe pollution events uh, over, over days, especially uh, in, in some uh, with together with photochemistry and, and other species like VOCs, volatile organic compounds, uh, nitrogen oxides, etc. Also, uh, other uh, events like uh, winter smoke, uh, here ozone is of less importance uh, because it's mainly um, present when we have uh, active uh, photochemistry. Uh, so, in the troposphere, um, the uh, near ground level of ozone is mainly uh, an air pollutant and it threatens uh, human health or the health of any uh, living being and, and also the ecosystems. Um, it, it therefore also can 
uh, lead to, for example, leaf injury in, in plants uh, resulting in crop uh, loss. And, and this is also important for food security. Then, and then on the other hand, you also know that ozone is not only bad, uh, it can also be important in the stratosphere. It, it plays an important role uh, because it absorbs uh, UV radiation from the sun. Because um, this um, composition of the atmosphere is important, we have uh, measurement uh, networks, like for example, the Global Atmosphere Watch Program, and also other networks, for example, on national uh, levels. Um, the Global Atmosphere Watch currently has uh, 30 global stations and around 400 uh, regional uh, stations. And when you look uh, here on the right side, I try to find a pointer. Okay, point. So, uh, here on the right side, uh, this is just from the GO station information system. Uh, ozone measurements, uh, surface ozone measurements. Unfortunately, unfortunately, it's not very up to date because the data exchange uh, between the data center and courses at the moment, I think it's not really uh, working, but, but it gives kind of an overview. And, and you see that the measurements are not uh, evenly distributed. We have uh, many measurements in Europe. Uh, also, if you, for example, look at this uh, publication from the uh, tropospheric ozone assessment report, uh, you see that there are many measurements, uh, especially in Europe and also in North America, where other parts of the world are uh, less um, good represented. And especially uh, there are uh, large areas without any data, uh, especially in Africa and, and Russia. Uh, as Sonia mentioned, we are running a World Calibration Center at EMPA, uh, which is one of the central facilities of the WMOGO program. Uh, we do this uh, since 1996. It already started before I uh, was um, at, at EMPA. Uh, and uh, we are responsible for uh, surface ozone, but also for other species, for carbon monoxide, methane, and uh, CO2. We also collaborate with other calibration centers, for example, for N2O uh, to increase uh, the number of the audits. And as Sonia mentioned, we have done more than 100 station audits for uh, surface ozone at global core stations. So let's go uh, a little bit uh, to the history of ozone. So ozone was detected almost uh, 200 years ago in 1839. Uh, by Christian Friedrich Schönbein, who was a professor at the University of Basel. Uh, at that time, uh, he used uh, this uh, potassium uh, iodine uh, measurement technique, uh, where you have um, paper with, um, impregnated with potassium iodide, uh, and that changes color uh, when, when it is exposed to uh, ozone because uh, elemental uh, iodine is, is produced. Of course, this is not very quantitative, but it, it was able to, uh, he was able to detect ozone with this uh, method. And he also detected uh, the presence of ozone in the atmosphere uh, a few, few years later. But it, until the 1950s, it was believed uh, that the ozone in the troposphere is mainly from, um, from the stratosphere, from intrusion from the stratosphere, which we know nowadays is, is of course not true. Uh, because it's uh, photochemically produced. I will not go into detail on how ozone is produced, uh, but um, it was then uh, linked in the 50s uh, with the Los Angeles smoke. It was also at very, uh, ozone was of very high interest at the time of uh, Schönbein uh, because uh, they believed, which kind is probably kind of true, but I mean, it still can be used to disinfect something. Um, uh, they believe that this has an important role as an air purifier and eliminating some disease organism. Then another important uh, person was Arie Hagen-Smith, uh, who did a lot of studies on uh, smog uh, in the Los Angeles area. Uh, here are some publications from, from the 50s uh, when he was um, uh, doing 
his uh, science uh, and he actually um, um, detected uh, that the ozone in the troposphere is formed uh, by photochemical uh, reactions. So why uh, do we measure ozone? Um, I think we touched upon this already. Uh, it has effects on human health. It can harm lung function. Uh, it uh, irritates the res respiratory system. Uh, it can lead uh, to premature death um, and, and illness uh, like asthma and, and, and bronchitis, for example. Uh, it also has effects uh, on, on the environment uh, because it uh, damages uh, vegetation uh, and it can lead to uh, leaf injury, uh, to loss of, um, for example, crop uh, production. So it's important. Uh, I have this from, from the US EPA uh, website, which uh, gives a nice overview of the uh, effects of um, ozone pollution. And because uh, it is uh, kind of harmful, uh, it's also a regulated um, air pollutant. Um, and there are threshold levels uh, set by many countries. Uh, here, just uh, an overview of a few of them. Uh, for example, the US EPA uh, has an eight hour standard of uh, 0 0.07 ppm uh, for ozone. Uh, the European Union uh, has uh, different threshold levels, uh, also different um, units here. Uh, in, in the EU, EU it's a microgram per cubic meter. They have uh, threshold levels, for example, for population information uh, threshold or population warning threshold, health protection threshold. And then also Switzerland has its own uh, standard, which is a little bit uh, more strict uh, compared uh, to the uh, European Union standard. Uh, of course, there are many other standards in, in other countries, and I maybe suggest that you check uh, this, the, the ozone uh, threshold levels of, of your uh, country. It can be interesting. So let's move to uh, surface ozone measurement techniques. Um, so I, I mentioned Schoenbein, but of course, I mean, nowadays these, these techniques uh, are, are no longer relevant. Um, sometimes ozone is also measured uh, with a chemiluminescence uh, technique. Uh, this is a reaction of ozone with, for example, ethane, uh, and it produces uh, ethane oxi oxide. Uh, and it emits light, which can be detected by a photomultiplier. Also reaction with NO is possible uh, for the chemiluminescence sense method. Uh, but this technique uh, is also not, it, it's not really widely used, especially not used for uh, air pollution monitoring. Uh, but it's, in some cases, it can be an ad advantage uh, if you have high um, levels of other uh, pollutants, for example, volatile organic compounds, uh, which can interfere, interfere in the uh, UV technique. And nowadays, uh, spectroscopic techniques uh, are most widely used. And it's, it's mainly, I mean, really the, the vast majority of, of all the measurements that we have uh, for, for surface ozone are based on, on UV absorption. Uh, and there are many different uh, instruments on the market, many different brands. Uh, are on the market and they are commercially available. I will uh, come to this uh, in, a, in a few minutes. So the measurement principle is uh, it's absor absorption of UV light. So you have, uh, in principle, you have a measurement cell. I lost my pointer, cannot move it anymore. Okay, well, I, not so important. Um, well, so you have, um, you have a measurement cell, you have a UV uh, source, so a light source, uh, and then you, you also have to measure uh, pressure and temperature, um, and uh, you have to know the absorption uh, coefficient. Um, and because these, like uh, temperature, pressure, uh, length of, of the uh, light path, that's all um, part of the international system uh, of, of units. So in, in principle, it's, it's SI uh, traceability. 
And this is uh, realized in the uh, ozone reference instruments that uh, we uh, have um, for, for the UV uh, instruments. And the ozone reference here is the NIST uh, standard reference photometer by the National Institute of Standards and Technology uh, from the United States. There are currently about 60 uh, instruments uh, worldwide. Um, and it, in, in principle, it's a direct uh, realization of, of SI traceability because it's, it's only measurements of uh, uh, the UV absorption. Uh, and, and when you know the absorption cross section, uh, your, your cell length, so, so here you have the, um, the measurement cells. Uh, here is the light source, here are the detectors. Uh, there is so manifold uh, to distribute uh, the ozone. It has an ozone generator. Uh, and then you can uh, make uh, different levels of, of ozone. Um, so it's, it's directly SI traceable. Uh, and um, well, I think the instruments exist since the early 80s. So this is uh, Jim Norris, who still works at, at NIST. Uh, producing these SRP instruments uh, with the first uh, instrument uh, in 1982. And we at EMPA, we have two uh, SRPs uh, in our laboratory. Uh, we use them for our national air pollution monitoring network and also for uh, the core activities. So traceability. Um, when you have measurements at the measurement site, uh, they should be uh, traceable. So this is, uh, for example, an analyzer at, at uh, any measurement station. So you need to calibrate uh, them. Uh, usually you do this uh, with um, calibration gases in the, in the case of ozone. This is not really possible because ozone, as you also probably know, it's, it's very reactive. So you cannot keep it in uh, like uh, standard gas cylinders, uh, like you can do for, for many other species, for CO2, for example, for methane, it's, it's relatively easy. They are stable over a very long time, but ozone is, is reactive. Uh, so you cannot uh, have any calibration gases. So you need uh, transfer instruments or traveling standards uh, with, with traceability. Uh, to an ozone uh, reference instrument. In, in case of UV, this is uh, usually an SRP. Uh, and actually the traceability chain uh, or in the go, it's, it's organized. We have um, central calibration labs and for ozone, uh, the central calibration lab in principle is, is NIST, uh, SRP number two. Uh, and then we have uh, like very calibration centers or uh, stations, they also have their own uh, laboratory standards uh, with traceability to an ozone uh, reference. Uh, and so you can ensure uh, traceability. Um, but ozone is a little bit uh, different because we have these 60 instruments worldwide and not only one uh, instrument, it's not only the SRP number two of NIST, uh, which is the primary standard, uh, because each of these SRPs is a direct realization of, of, of a primary standard. Uh, we have kind of, of 60 uh, primary standards. Uh, and these primary standards, they are compared uh, in the uh, key comparisons uh, organized by the BIPM uh, in France. Uh, and you see this is just a, um, a, a screenshot I took from, from the latest results. Well, it's, it's ongoing. It started in 2007. Uh, pilot study was even earlier. Uh, and you see the results. Uh, so uh, only national metrology uh, institutes uh, can participate. Uh, also, we can participate because we are designated uh, insti uh, institute by WMO. So we rep represent uh, WMO uh, and also can participate in this uh, key comparison. And within the uncertainty, uh, we have agreement uh, between all these uh, SRPs. So it's more like the family of, of ozone reference instruments that uh, define the, the reference. 
um, um, but they, they have an uncertainty. And um, yes, you can have a look at the uncertainty budget. Um, so there are different uh, contributions to the overall uncertainty of, of the reference instruments. Uncertainty, um, of course, this is only the, the uncertainty of the of the reference instrument. You have to propagate this then to uh, to your measurements at at the measurement uh, sites. There are many other contributions to uncertainty, but the SRP uh, there are uh, contributors like the optical path length because you have to measure it, and and there you have a, a, an uncertainty. Uh, then you have pressure and temperature measurements, which also have an uncertainty. Uh, the ratio of intensities, but by far the most important contribution to the uncertainty is uh, the uncertainty of the absorption cross section. And in the uh, standard reference photometers for ozone, uh, they, since the beginning, they use a value which was published in the 1960s uh, by Hearn et al. And this is likely uh, to. Um, it likely will be changed in, over the next uh, few years, uh, because in 2019, uh, Joe Hodges published uh, a recommendation of a, of a new consensus value of the absorption cross-section uh, at this uh, 253.65 nanometer. Uh, this is the wavelength uh, where uh, we, we, we do this U absorption measurements. And there will be a new value. Um, it will take probably a few years from now, uh, but the new absorption cross section is lower compared to the uh, to the one that is currently used from from 1961, and this has consequences because it will change uh, also the ozone amount fractions uh, that are measured uh, with SRPs and then propagated uh, to uh, analyzers in the field and. Uh, a lower absorption cross section means uh, that the ozone amount fraction will increase by about uh, plus 1.3 percent with the new value. And of course, this can have uh, implications also for uh, the violation, for example, of threshold uh, levels. So let's have a look at the stability uh, of um, the standard reference photometers. As I mentioned, we have two of them at EMPA, uh, one since uh, 1993, number 15. Uh, and then we bought another one 20 years ago, uh, number 23. And uh, since then, we are regularly comparing them against each other. Um, so you see here a comparison. Uh, this is the difference between the two instruments, and it gives a slope. Uh, and I, I just make this kind of plots. Um, so we have here the green area here is the goal that we have in the, in the goal program. So a maximum deviation of one ppb in the range from zero to 100 uh, ppb or nanomole per mole, uh, which which is the same, but the correct unit is is nanomole per mole. Um, and then I, I look at the bias in the, in the middle of this uh, amount fraction. Uh, so that's here at 50 ppb. So, so this point or this, this um, comparison actually translates into this point here. So we have a positive slope uh, and a little bit of a positive bias. And when you look at, at all the comparisons, uh, you see that uh, this SRP is, is very stable over time. But of course, uh, it also changed a little bit sometimes because in the beginning it was different. Uh, we, we also found out why it was a, a, um, some uh, mistake in, in one of the electronic uh, boards with a wrong capacitor. So, so here we had clearly a bias, but since uh, 2002, uh, it's, it's more or less stable in the, and, and it further improved in uh, 2007. Uh, where we, where where there was another upgrade of the SRP systems um, that compensated for some systematic uh, measurement biases uh, due to uh, multiple reflections in the measurement cell. So so there, um, so this was um, corrected with tilted windows that um, um, 
prevents uh, the, the light beam from, from doing multi multiple reflections and also better thermal insulation because there was kind of a temperature gradient over the measurement cell. Uh, and the temperature measurement was made only at one point. Uh, so the temperature gradient is now also smaller and this uh, gives an improved or a lower uncertainty of the uh, temperature measurement. So here again, you see um, since 2007, it's, it's really uh, stable. And we also could confirm this um, by uh, comparisons with other uh, institutes. Uh, sometimes we compare our SRP uh, with, with NIST. Um, we have comparisons with SRP number zero and two. Uh, we take part in the BIPM uh, key comparison. And also we compare uh, with other um, SRPs that we have in Switzerland, uh, Metas, the Swiss uh, National Metrology Institute. Uh, they also have two SRPs, 14 and 18. Uh, and also here you see that since 2007, uh, we have uh, improved stability. Somehow the pointer does not really make what I want, but anyway, um, okay. So we have uh, improved stability. So so and and uh, when you when you look at this, it's it's really um, much smaller than the, than the compatibility goal that we have in in uh, for for core. Then we have ozone analyzers, uh, and here they have it. They have the same operating principle as as the uh, standard reference photometer uh, instruments. Uh, so it's, it's also U reabsorption. Uh, it's also um, measurement cells. SRP has two measurement cells. Uh, some of the uh, ozone analyzers, they also have two measurement cells. Some have only one. I will show this later. Um, um, you need reference, uh, also a reference uh, gas, which means just the same um, air, but without ozone uh, in, in in the analysis, this is achieved uh, with uh, ozone scrubbers or ozone converters. Uh, I will show this uh, more in more detail shortly. Um, but let's just move for one minute. Let's move away from 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 ozone, and I because ozone is a little bit uh, different uh, because the measurement technique over the last thirty years was all, always the same. It wasn't. I mean there. There are a few alternatives, but uh, I, I guess 99% or even more of all the ozone measurements are made uh, with UV absorption. This, is, this has not been the case for many other uh, parameters, like for example, uh, carbon monoxide. We have a lot of different measurement techniques there. And there was also a, a huge improvement uh, in performance over the last uh, 20 years. Uh, with a trend from slow to fast measurements from quasi continuous to continuous from single to multi species. And some of the multi species instruments, uh, even today, they can measure uh, also ozone uh, together with many, many other species. So, so there is uh, clearly uh, um, a, a progress uh, can be seen, especially over the last 10 years, uh, but also 20 years. Uh, there was huge uh, progress and I make some little advertisement for the next uh, uh, GoTech webinar that we have in one week from now. So my colleague Martin Steinbacher, he will uh, give you some uh, information about develops, developments uh, for carbon monoxide. Then we also had uh, some developments uh, on the uh, low end. Uh, I mentioned this because um, Low cost sensors are becoming more important. Uh, there are also ozone uh, or, or also low cost sensors for ozone on the market. Unfortunately, most of these instruments, they are not really uh, giving uh, good results because they uh, are relatively cheap uh, sensors. They um, very often um, have interferences with many other um, components or they are also uh, like, uh, for example, temperature uh, dependent. So, so low cost sensor is, is very difficult, uh, but, but there is also kind of a development in, it's not only low cost sensors, real sensors, but 
uh, it's also uh, a trend that more and more uh, like uh, miniaturized uh, instruments are coming on the on the market and and also you can find uh, some for ozone for example and 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 here there there is some potential uh, to to have a, a good performance because it's it's exactly the same measurement principle as 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 reference or the the let's say research uh, grade uh, instruments but it's it's just smaller uh, of course you will have more uncertainty more noise uh, but in principle uh, it's the same uh, technique just very small uh, cheaper uh, so there is some potential there and some development uh, as well uh, but um, most of, of the low-cost sensors are really difficult to operate, cheap to buy, uh, difficult uh, in interpreting the data. Uh, and I mean, you can do nice and interesting things with, with those sensors, but then you need to invest a lot of time, a lot of know-how, uh, and in the end, it might not be so cheap again. Um, so I, I strongly recommend that you look at, uh, if you are interested in low-cost sensors, that, that you look at this report, uh, also WMO report, uh, where I also contributed a little bit, especially to the first version, but also to the second, uh, which is from December last year. It gives an overview about uh, low-cost sensors. Then, as I mentioned, uh, for ozone, there was not uh, much um, development uh, over the past 30 years. It's uh, UV absorption instruments. Uh, I show here instruments from Fermo, but there are many other uh, brands uh, as well available and uh, they are concerning performance. There is not really a big uh, difference between uh, different brands. Um, it was not really much uh, development. So the first instrument, for example, from, from Fermo, I think it's, it was the first it, it started. I don't really know when it came on the market, uh, but until 1995, uh, had al already ex exactly the same uh, operating principle as, as the, the current model that we have now. Um, but of course, the electronics at that time was not so good. It has on, had only analog output. So there was some, some progress, but not really much. And especially here from the mid nineties until now, the performance uh, is almost, almost the same. So there was not compared to like other species, uh, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, methane, where we have a huge development, there is uh, not so much uh, development in, in ozone. But of course, ozone is also a little bit uh, a, a simple measurement uh, technique and, and the performances uh, of these uh, UV analyzers is, is good enough for uh, what we want to do. So, so that's, that's fine. So uh, measurement uh, principle, uh, I, I mentioned it already. So there are instruments, uh, UV absorption instruments uh, using one measurement cell. So this is again a, a very old uh, picture or a picture of a very old instrument. I think it's no longer on the market, but you see here one measurement cell. Uh, so the principle here is you have your air inlet, uh, then it goes to the measurement cell. Um, uh, you have a UV lamp, uh, you have a detector, uh, you, you measure pressure and temperature. Uh, and you calculate uh, the ozone amount fraction uh, with, with this. Uh, of course, you need the reference, and there uh, the air passes over this uh, scrubber uh, here that removes uh, all the ozone, but otherwise it should not change uh, the, the, the metrics. This is important uh, because otherwise you will have uh, interference if you, if you change the metrics as, as, as soon as you have something which also absorbs uh, UV light in the same uh, spectral region. So this is um, relatively straightforward. Uh, I think most instruments uh, that are currently available on the market are using this uh, one cell, one measurement cell measurement principle, uh, except uh, the thermal instruments. Uh, and I think also uh, to be tech, maybe, maybe there are others, but I don't know. Uh, they are using two measurement cells. 
So, so here is an example of Fermo. Uh, there is also a model of uh, 2B. This is a, a small instrument, uh, which is cheaper um, compared to uh, the other ones, uh, but it has the same measurement principle uh, and it's, it's kind of a low cost instrument. Um, um, but, but still gives uh, quite good uh, results. So here you have two measurement cells and the air from the air inlet is split. Uh, and so one, one airstream goes directly to, to one of the measurement cells. So here you have air, my pointer does not make what I want. Uh, so here you have uh, air with ozone and then the other part passes over the scrubber and in the other measurement cell, you have your reference. Um, and then you switch between the two cells. Um, okay. You switch between the two cells. Okay, that was too fast. You switch between the two cells and then you have the reference in the other cell uh, and you, you make the ratios uh, to, to calculate uh, the ozone amount fraction. Also here, you of course, you have to measure pressure and temperature as well. Um, the measurement principle is exactly the same as, as for, for the SRPs, but of course the realization is not uh, as perfect because the cells, they are much shorter and, and that's why these instruments, they can be uh, calibrated. Um, I will come to this uh, later. Okay, so um, then there are also things that can go wrong. And uh, when you are running a ozone analyzer in the field, usually these instruments are stable uh, over time. They do not really need a lot of maintenance. They need some, I will uh, come to this. Uh, but things that ca can go wrong, wrong uh, are, for example, leaks in, in the solenoid wells. This uh, happens very often. So normally, if, if everything works fine, um, the air is going uh, to one of the cells. It's a little bit slow, okay. Uh, so you have here, you have the reference and you have the air with ozone, but in case you have a, a leak in, in one of the solenoids, uh, then some, some of the, for example, of the scrubbed air uh, can leak uh, into the cell uh, with, with the air with ozone. Uh, and, and then you will have a lower reading of, of your analyzer. And usually these leaks, they, they can appear um, very slowly. Uh, in the beginning, a very small leak. It gives only a, a slightly lower reading and then it starts to increase and it gets uh, bigger and bigger and, and you, it's very hard to, to actually uh, realize this. So it's a little bit uh, dangerous. Um, also scrubber efficiency uh, can be an issue uh, because uh, uh, in, 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 in a normal case, a scrubber um, removes 100% uh, of, of, of the ozone and a good scrubber removes only ozone. Um, and all other potential uh, interference, like for example, VOCs, uh, also water vapor can be a problem, uh, will pass through the scrubber. Uh, so this is, this is fine, but um, there is also, uh, a, it is also possible that sometimes uh, a scrubber degrades and then it's, it's only partly efficient and it, you will have the same effect as, as um, with leaking solenoid valves. Uh, it will, you will have lower ozone readings. And also here, this is very difficult uh, to detect. Um, and for example, um, this is an example that shows uh, such a bad uh, scrubber. Uh, it's also already quite old now, but in 2003, uh, we did an audit at the uh, Asequem site uh, go, go station in, in Algeria. Uh, and then we realized at that time something is wrong with the instrument. Uh, and we were able to identify that it was a scrubber. Uh, but then we were looking at the data 
and with with a statistical filter we were able to identify the period uh, when the problem started so it's it's very difficult because because you have a large uh, natural variation of, of the ozone here and then here the problem starts and and it degrades and you have lower values and from the data alone it would be very hard to see um, so it is really important to um, be aware of, of these potential problems uh, for, for ozone analyzers and uh, in this case for example in, in Asaka we had to flag um, almost one one and a half year years of data as uh, in, invalid because it's it's also impossible to um, to quantify the loss you, you don't really know was it uh, 10 percent 20 percent um, that's that's really difficult the same is true for if you have a leak in, in a solenoid there are some some tests that you can do and I, I strongly recommend uh, that you do this um, I think these tests are probably available for for all analyzers I'm, I'm mainly familiar with firmware analyzers uh, there you can do a uh, so-called AB ozone test uh, if you have a calibrate or an ozone generator and then you produce 500 ppb of ozone uh, and you uh, run this AB test so uh, each cell gives independent measurements and the difference between the two cells should be less than three uh, percent if it's more uh, then there is likely uh, that you have a problem with the solenoids or it could also be the scrubber, but the scrubber is, is less uh, likely. So what normally happens is uh, if something goes wrong, it's, it's really the solenoid, uh, something that goes wrong that you don't realize. I mean, there are other things that can go wrong. For example, the pump, if the pump stops, but then you will see it because this gives an alarm. You have not enough flow uh, through the instruments. Uh, the instrument will tell you uh, not enough flow, you will check the pump, you will see it. Uh, but solenoids and scrubber is difficult uh, to, to detect. So regular checks uh, are important. Um, I think it's uh, whenever you can do it, and I think nowadays this should also be not a problem because you have uh, your uh, data acquisition systems, they usually are uh, not like in the past where you acquired analog signals, you acquire uh, digital signals from the instrument and this gives you the opportunity to uh, acquire as many instrument uh, parameters as possible because this uh, can be important uh, for, for diagnostics later on like flows, temperature, pressures, uh, intensities, etc. Also calibration settings uh, in case uh, you, you change uh, these uh, by accident, for example, it's important that uh, you uh, monitor this. Uh, other instrument maintenance for, for ozone, there is not so much you have to do. Of course, you need to change inlet filters. And here again, because of the reactive reactivity of ozone, it's important that you choose the right materials, which is also true for the whole inlet system. Uh, so Teflon can be used for the inlet filters. So it's only Teflon uh, for the inlet system. Um, it can be also other materials, but it, it must be inert and it, uh, it must be something that does not uh, destroy ozone. Uh, so, so either the, uh, um, the, the way on how it is realized or uh, contact with surfaces should be minimized. Uh, if, if there are contacts with surfaces, then it has to be like Teflon or glass. Uh, and, and no other materials, uh, because then you have a chance that you lose uh, ozone. Of course, this can also be cleaned, also the measurement cells. I also would be, when you protect the, the instrument with, with filters, then I think cleaning of measurement cells is, you can do it, but uh, you should also be careful that you don't do it too much, uh, too, too often, sorry, uh, because sometimes, uh, it's 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 not really uh, necessary and if you like for example if you service the instrument 
like every two years and you are running it in a really deep, depends also where you run it. If it's a heavily polluted site, then maybe um, it, it should be done more often, but otherwise uh, just do it as, as required. Okay, so um, we have these analyzers um, and they need to be calibrated. Um, usually, and I think all, all the uh, instruments on, on the market, they have uh, the ozone analyzers, they have adjustable uh, calibration settings. Uh, usually it's a span or background and offset um, uh, or yeah, offset or background or span or slope, uh, sometimes it is called, uh, and you can adjust this when you compare them against reference instrument, which can be either uh, directly an SRP. This is in most cases not uh, uh, the case because you, you don't really have an SRP available, but sometimes uh, some institutes maybe have. Uh, others, they can use an ozone calibrator, a laboratory standard, a transfer standard uh, with traceability to an SRP and then uh, compare uh, with the ozone analyzers. And then you have in principle two options. You can adjust uh, the calibration settings in a way that uh, you have a perfect match or almost a perfect match as, as good as you can do. Uh, or you can also apply uh, uh, post uh, correction to the data uh, because you know the relationship, uh, you know the bias, um, um, slope and intercept, and you can correct it or afterwards. So there are two possibilities, but once it is calibrated, um, then it, I, I recommend that you don't really change the settings too often. If if they change, if you have one calibration and half a year later, the next calibration, calibration frequency, yes. Um, it's because it's it's relatively stable. It's it's not, ozone instruments are, are usually not drifting away. Uh, so calibration frequency um, is, you, you don't have to do it too often. Uh, so every three months, for example, is is already quite often. Uh, every half year, or maybe depending if you are in a region where you have a very distinct uh, seasonal cycle of ozone, then maybe you want to, to do it uh, to cover all these seasons. Uh, but if you see changes which are large, then most likely something is wrong with the analyzer. Uh, so, so be careful, don't just adjust the settings uh, because if they change uh, significantly, uh, this is usually uh, some kind of indication that something is wrong uh, with, with, with the analyzer or the calibrator, but this has to be checked. Um, so to do uh, ozone calibration, you need a zero air, and there are certain requirements for the zero air. So it has to be dry. Uh, there is a, uh, a standard for this, a DEAN standard, uh, 14. 626 from 2012, the last edition, uh, requirements regarding water vapor. Uh, it also has to be, of course, free of ozone and, and other interfering compounds uh, such as uh, toluene and uh, xylene, for example, which uh, can cause interference. So the zero air uh, has relatively uh, strict requirements that you use for these ozone calibrations. I will show now how some uh, traveling uh, standard uh, comparisons. So we we are using uh, instruments, um, calibrators, ozone calibrators uh, in, in the field uh, to calibrate uh, ozone analyzers. And for example, for the, for the core audits that I do, um, there, you, we really have to make sure that the traceability chain is as short as possible. Uh, so I compare my traveling standard against uh, against one of my uh, standard reference photometers uh, before I go to the field. So these are the uh, orange points here. And then I do the field measurements and I uh, come back and compare it again. Um, and, and this is usually three, four months later when I go to a gore station 
uh, because it's shipping, uh, there are some parallel measurements at the go station, so it takes quite some time. And you see, this is really stable. Uh, it's it's not really changing uh, very much. Uh, and also the uh, comparison between traveling standards and SRP, they are uh, well within half of of the uh, data quality objective that we have for ozone measurements in the in the GAR program. So now, uh, in in this graph, I show um, the the results of, of of the ozone audits that we did over the last uh, twenty five years. So this is more than one hundred uh, individual comparisons for different instruments. Uh, here again, you have the goal uh, that we have in GAR, and and uh, of course. Not all the instruments in the field are, are meeting uh, this goal. It's maybe roughly, well, I would have to look uh, because there are many points here in the middle, but it's uh, a little bit more of, I think, uh, yeah, a little bit more than half of the instruments that, uh, that meet uh, these requirements. Uh, and what you also see, these are different uh, brands. Uh, well, in the beginning, there were some old instruments in the 90s and early uh, 2000, um, 2000 and until 2005, five, but most of them are now replaced. Monitor Labs at that time and the CB, uh, also uh, Fermo instruments 49, model 49. They, they were not as good as, as the instruments that we have nowadays, but I mean, you, you see even other brands and, and, and performance is very, very similar. So there is kind of an improvement over time, uh, but still, I mean, it's, it's, it's relatively difficult to reach this one, uh, this one uh, PPP or one nanomole per mole uh, goal that we have in, in core. Uh, yes, uh, yeah, it's it's fifty six percent of the instruments so far. When you look at all the comparisons where within within the goal, if you look only at the forty nine C and forty nine I, it's sixty one. But I think it's not because it's Fermo instruments. It's because uh, we don't have these old uh, uh, instruments uh, in these comparisons. So also other brands they will perform a similar compared to. Uh, the firmer instruments. So these uh, are the stations that we have audited already, uh, many of them several times. So this brings me almost uh, to the end of my uh, presentation, but I want to mention a few more things. Um, so successful measurements of air quality with good uh, data quality needs not only uh, know-how, not only instruments, it also needs uh, sufficient funding and, and, and an adequ adequate infrastructure. So you, you, just, you cannot just buy an ozone analyzer, uh, switch it on uh, and then measure ozone and, and then think that's it. No, it's, it, you need sufficient funding. You need funding for maintenance. Um, because instruments, they can break down. So it's actually much more uh, expensive. And especially in, in case of ozone, uh, you also need adequate in, in infrastructure, for example, a adequate inlet system uh, where you don't have a loss of ozone um, in the inlet system, because this is really also one of the things that can go wrong because ozone is so reactive. You need uh, not only the instrument, you need uh, some calibration facilities or you have access to, uh, to an ozone standard, for example. Uh, you need a data acquisition uh, system um, and, and so on. You also need, uh, if you want to do measurements, for example, in the GOR program, you need a long-term commitment. Uh, here a good example, Ian Galbally at uh, the Gore Station Cape Grim. He worked uh, with Ozone for uh, decades, I think. Really long-term commitment also of the, of, of, of the Institute uh, performing such measurements is needed. Uh, you need uh, educated staff and enough staff. Uh, here also a good example. Uh, I, I, I found uh, 
uh, is on your staff. Uh, enough staff, educated staff is important. Uh, you need clear responsibilities and also knowledge sharing because operators sometimes leave um, or there are different people responsible for measurements. So knowledge needs to be shared. You need collaboration with national and international uh, partners. Um, this is all very important. And last but not least, also um, an efficient administration. And this is sometimes you, you can not really influence this, but uh, in, I mean, the, the administration, for example, if bu bureaucracy uh, is, is, is different in, in, in different parts of the world. And uh, our experience is that in, in some places it's more difficult. Uh, and then it's also difficult uh, to react. For example, if you have um, an instrument that breaks down, you, you must be able to, to act uh, immediately uh, to solve the problem because otherwise you, you will have data loss. And well, the last thing I, I'd like to show is um, there is a guideline for the uh, continuous measurements of tropospheric ozone. Uh, it's the GORE report 209. Uh, which, which was published in 2013. I recommend that you look at this report. I think it's still up to date because ozone has not really, or, or the measurement of ozone, it, it has not really changed very much over the last uh, two decades. So this report is up to date. Uh, the only thing that will change um, for sure in the near future is the absor absorption uh, cross section. I think then, uh, these reports, uh, together with many other standards like uh, ISO documents that deal with ozone, they need to be um, um, revised and, and new versions should come out. So with this, I would like to come to the end and I would like to thank you for your attention and also would like to thank Meteor Swiss for the support of the GO activities uh, at EMPA and, and also, of course, uh, the staff at various GO stations for, for their support, support during the audits. So thank you very much. Thank you, Christoph, for your very detailed and interesting presentation. Uh, I'd like to start the question and answer session now. We have collected some questions in the chat box. And I will read the first one. It says, which is the more correct designation for the current method, spectroscopy or UV photometry? Uh, well, um, I, I think U, UV photometry is, um, is a little, little bit more specific because you, you, you say uh, already what you are doing. It's, it's UV. Uh, photometry uh, that's that's correct and i think this is a part this is a kind of a spectroscopic technique uh, uh, and and there are other spectroscopic techniques uh, but uv photometry yes yes that's that's correct and, and probably more specific all right thanks christoph for a great talk uh, i'll ask the Second question, uh, we have a couple from Orlando, but I think the first one was answered. So I'll skip to the second. Uh, how long is the average lifetime of ozone analyzers? Um, the, the lifetime of, of ozone analyzers is, is quite long, uh, especially when you, uh, when you compare it to, to other uh, instruments for, for other species. Uh, part of it is because, um, for, for other species, for, for example, for like for carbon monoxide, uh, it's it's not only the lifetime, but it's also the the, the progress that 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 is made. You you probably want to change to a new analyzer, not because your analyzer is not working any longer, but because there are better instruments on, on the market. And this is not the case for, for ozone. So the lifetime is quite long. It of course depends on how well you maintain it. Um, the measurement principle is also not so complicated and it's also relatively easy uh, to, to repair uh, an ozone analyzer. Uh, I, I mentioned, for example, this uh, 
leaky solenoids. If you have uh, such, such a case, then you can replace it. Um, after this, um, it will work again for years. It's, it's a little bit difficult to say because especially the solenoids, they can break within two years or they can last for 20 years. It's, it's very difficult uh, to predict, but the lifetime is uh, at least, um, I would say, like something like 10 years. Or Great, no thank oh, Sorry. <laughs> sorry, Christoph. Uh, the next question is from Sama Aldabar. Um, she says, thanks for the valuable information. How to join the global network of ozone monitoring? Um, so that's um, a difficult question. So how to join the global network of ozone monitoring? Uh, well, if you are running a station um, and if you want, if you are interested in, in becoming part of, of, of GORE, then I think you can apply for this uh, at, at WMO. I think you have to show um, that you are already successfully running it for, for a certain time. Um, it in the beginning it most likely will be kind of a local or regional station. Um, uh, you can apply for this. Uh, I think there are some some requirements, uh, especially regarding uh, long term commitment uh, that that you have to fulfill. Uh, but but in principle you can apply for it with, with WMO and maybe probably Claudia could answer this question better than I. Uh, yeah, but it's, it's a process that, uh, that you, you, can, you can approach uh, WMO. Thank you, Christoph. Yeah, I will post the link where um, the procedure is explained, but it's pretty much as you said, so thank you. Um, the next question is, it could be said that low-cost sensors would only serve for specific studies, but not for continuous monitoring. Um, yeah, yes. Um, I, I think for continuous monitoring, especially if it's like uh, legal monitoring, low-cost sensors are, they cannot be used because is because the data quality there is, is certainly not good enough. But uh, I mean, they can be used for, 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 for different campaigns, for example, if you are just interested in, in differences between sites, for example, you, but, but you have to be careful because when you use a low cost sensors, they, um, and, and you, let's say you buy 100 and you, you, you distribute them in a city, uh, then, then it's difficult to compare them because they each of them it probably behaves different than the other one, and so that's it's really difficult. I think low cost sensors they can be used, uh, especially um, if if you use them in, in addition to some existing um, measurement network where you have the possibility uh, to link measurements or to. Uh, to, to, to kind of reference instruments, because otherwise uh, it might be difficult. It, it also depends on, on the sensor, because there are, uh, in, in, the, in the field of low-cost sensors, there's a huge variety and also a huge difference uh, between uh, performance of individual sensors. Some of them are better, some of them are um, not good at all. They, they just uh, give absolutely wrong numbers and this is relatively difficult. I mean, sometimes you see it straight away, but not always because um, it's, it's not easy to, to see if, if, a, if a number can be correct or wrong um, in, in, in some cases. So they, they can be used. And I think uh, the guideline or this recommendation document, the WMO report, um, 1215 uh, gives some examples where, where low-cost sensors can make uh, sense. And, and also low-cost very often does not really mean low-cost. Uh, 
when you want to have uh, something useful uh, in the end uh, with the data, because then you need to invest much, much more into data analysis uh, compared to uh, like normal ozone analysis or, uh, or I mean, this is true for, for probably any other species as well. Thanks for that. There's some very good points in there. Um, I'll jump in with the last question. Um, well, it's from me. Um, I'm curious if it's possible to, uh, and if there's interest in reprocessing older data with the new ozone absorption cross-section that you mentioned. Uh, yes, this, this should not be uh, very complicated. Um, so the absorption cross-section will change. And in the SRP and I think most of the UV uh, instruments, they were, or, or at least they should have been calibrated against uh, um, an SRP uh, instrument. So there, it was one absorption cross-section that was used uh, from Hearn uh, in, in, published in, in 1961. And the new absorption cross-section is uh, by 1.29% lower. Uh, compared to the Hearn value. So in, in principle, it's just a factor. Uh, it's, it's easy to uh, reprocess the data because it's, it's only a factor. Um, I think it's very important that you also report uh, when you, for example, when you submit data to the World Data Center for reactive gases or to any other uh, database, um, um, having ozone data, it's very important that you specify uh, the ozone absorption cross-section in, in the metadata. This, until now, uh, unfortunately, was not always the case. Um, so if you look uh, at data, for example, available from World Data Center for Reactive Gases, then you very often see, uh, in, in when you look at the measurement method, you see only UV absorption. Uh, but that that's not the whole story because the whole story is is it's UV absorption and we used the absorption cross section from Hearn in 1990 uh, in, in, from 1961 uh, and then it's clear um, and so the new value the new consensus value uh, that will well there is currently a task uh, group working on this and i'm 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 member of this uh, task group as well uh, so there was an initial timeline to change this uh, for the year uh, 2024 but i think this will be a little bit uh, too challenging uh, so it probably will be a little bit later then uh, because some of the uh, standard documents have, have to be changed, like uh, some ISO standards, for example. And this, this process usually takes uh, quite some time. But it, it's conversion between the two absorption cross sections should, should be easy. OK, so I think we have no more questions. Um, thank you again, Christoph, for being here today and uh, doing this presentation. I would think we will close the webinar now. Uh, we will also uh, would also like to advertise our next webinar. Uh, Martin Steinbacher will speak at uh, the 4th of November. This is next Thursday. Uh, his topic is uh, measurement techniques of carbon monoxide in the atmosphere. Uh, we posted the link in the chat box. I hope to see you next week and uh, wish you a pleasant week.